Okay, so we're going to tackle uh, uh, verse 26 and verse 27. So we're going to be going all the way from Surah Qaf to Surah uh, Hadith, the end of Surah Hadith. This is where the Quran divides into different parts. And one of those parts is called a group of surahs uh, called Surah Al Mufassal. And Surah Al Mufassal begin there's ikhtilaf, but inshallah, stronger opinion seems to be that it begins from Surah Qaf going all the way to Surah Nas. So you have example the the long surahs of the Quran, which are from Baqarah to Anfal, which are like the Riwal. Then you have the other surahs, uh, which are the even even past Anfal uh, fact. Then you have the other surahs, which are like uh, the. Uh, the surahs which uh, the uh, which uh, contains a hundred verses, uh, and then you have also the mufassal as well. And the mufassal are those surahs which uh, have many breaks in them and have shorter uh, verses. In them. And the benefit of knowing this is because even the surahs mufassal are divided into uh, three or four different sections. So there's some who it's recommended to recite fajr and then others to recite at Nabdiv and others to recite at Isha. Um, these surahs from verse, uh, from uh, Surah Qaf all the way to Surah Hadith, they have a very common uh, characteristic between all of them. And that is that they all ask the reader to choose between two parts. So obviously this may be in the form of Jannah and Nar, it may be other things as well, we're just going to we'll come across those uh, shortly. So let's begin with Surah Qaf. And Surah Qaf has a strong emphasis on the hereafter, on the resurrection, and in actual fact it begins with death, which is the starting point of the Day of Judgment. So example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says in the 19th verse, وَجَاءَتْ سَسْرَةُ الْمَوْتِ بِالْحَقِّ ذَلِكَ مَا كُنْتَ مِنْ فَتَحِيدٍ The throes of death come revealing the truth. That is what you were trying to evade. Then subsequently Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the blowing of the trumpet. And verse 20, the trumpet will be blown, that is the day of the threat. We come across some horrifying scenes on the day of judgment. Verse 23 to 24. His inseparable comrade will say, meaning the Qareem, this is what I have ready for you, hurled into, into hell every uh, every uh, every uh, obdurate uh, kafir, every non Muslim. And even the uh, this uh, the uh, the verses which relate to uh, the creation, they also have a strong connection to the resurrection. So if we example read verse nine to eleven, the first part says, "And we sent down the blessed water from the sky and made the gardens grow by it and grain harvesting and sowing date palm let layered spades as provision for, uh, uh, for our slaves." By it we brought <coughs> by it we brought the dead land to life. That is how the emergence will take place. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using the creation, something that we can see, something that we can relate to, something that we can witness, as a symbol of how he will give life back to the dead, and this is how we will all be gathered. Uh, together on the Day of Judgment. Because of the contents of the Surah, 
It is one surah that will soften one's heart. It doesn't matter how hard, how harsh, how hard are. This is one surah that will soften the people's hearts. This is one of the wisdoms why the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would recite this surah in his uh, some of his khutbas of Jumu'ah. This will be sufficient because one of the reminders that's required on the khutbah of Jumu'ah is to soften the people's hearts, and this is sufficient as a reminder. After mentioning the resurrection and the horrors of the day and the dangers of the hellfire. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks and discusses about two groups and this is where the choice comes as I mentioned that the choice the two choices that are mentioned in each of these surahs the choice comes at this point Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 13 <laughs> On the day we will ask hellfire are you full and then the hellfire will say is there more to come so the hellfire will heat up human beings and this is the fuel, this is the food of the hellfire. Now the ayah that comes straight after this verse 30, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the translation is, and the gardens will be brought up close to those who are taqwa, not far away. So this is the choice of Surah Qaf, the choice that we have been given, the choice of the hellfire or the choice of paradise. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he discusses in this surah and focuses on three inclinations that lead us to the hellfire or lead us to the deviation. The first one is the whispering of the soul. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 16, That we created man, we know what his own self whispers to him, we are nearer to him than his own judge of pain. Another way or inclination <coughs> of deviation is the qareeb, the jinn devil that is with us. In verse 27, that his inseparable comrade will say, Our Lord, I did not make him overstep the limits. He was in any case far astray. But another thing is that of Khafna. And this is one of the aims of Surah Al Anbiya, the concept of Ghafla and the roles of the prophets in awakening us from the Ghafla. You were heedless of this, uh, heedless of this, so we have stripped you of your covering, and today your sight is sharp. This surah it concludes in the best possible way that reforms the heart, that helps us make the right choice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the translation is, we know the best what they say. You are not the dictator over them, so remind them of the Quran, whosoever fears my prayer. This is verse 45. And as I said, that the relationship between the name of the surah and the contents of the surah is very important. And it reveals to us the aim of the surah. So people may ask, you know, how can you find out what the aim of the surah is by simply looking at the letter? Uh, and this is an example, so it's half. This is because this is there are many words in the surah which mention the letter half. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indicates to us in the surah. And in actual fact, not indicating, he said it quite clearly that one of the ways that we can reform and rectify our hearts is looking at the Quran. Because there's many words in here that begin with half or have half in it that also relate to this one, like the concept of qayyim and, uh, and so on and so forth. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying the greatest aid in achieving the soundness of our heart is through the Quran. The next surah, Adhariyat, and Adhariyat are like winds, it's sometimes translated as uh, winnowers. And the main feature of it is a fitru in Allah, to, to, fit, to flee to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to run to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And like I mentioned that each of these surahs, they give us a choice, they talk about two different things. The surah here, surah Adhariyat, 
it talks about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala depriving. And knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who gives and the one who deprives, then surely through Allah's command, uh, uh, so, so knowing this, we will realize that He is the only one we can seek refuge in. <coughs> there is nothing that can protect us except His protection. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins the surah with four oaths. Four oaths. The first one is by the scatterers scattering. And this is a powerful wind that scatters the cloud, preventing it from giving us rain. The second oath, and those who bear weighty loads. And this is another powerful wind, but it does the opposite. Instead of bringing us, preventing or depriving us from rain, it sends us, it sends us rain. So here is an example of how the surah begins with the representing representation of that which deprives and that which gives. So the choice is ours. While Surah Qas's message was choosing between Jannah and Nar, this is about giving and the, the giving and deprivation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the, that's the reason why the surah was named after this. The third oath is فَالْجَارِيَاتِ <coughs> Yusra, and those speeding along with ease and this is a reference to the ships that float on the sea that carry the, the, the load or the livelihood of the people and the fourth one is فَالْمُقَسِّمَاتِ <coughs> Amra, those who are and those appointed the command and those are the angels who distribute the livelihood to man. So knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his power is the choice of those who order the angels who distribute the, 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 the livelihood of men and with him is the power to scatter the clouds which will bring about the rain or bringing the clouds to bring about the rain then, and the one who manages the food, then we realize that he is the one who we should seek refuge in, he is the one that we should run to, he is the one which he later says that we fulfill will be Allah, the one that we should turn to. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after this mentioned a number of his provisions. So he mentions uh, the believers that their provisions is reserved in Jannah for them. So example in verse 22 to 23, your provision is in heaven and what you are promised by the Lord of the heavens and the earth, it is certainly the truth just as you have, uh, just as you have speech. So even after all of these proofs, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with him is that power, he gives us more examples. So even if at this point we do not believe, we will believe after these verses. In verse 44 to 49, he says, As for heaven, we built it with great power and gave it its vast expanse. And the earth, we spread it like a carpet and how, we, and how well we smoothed it out. And we created all things in pairs so that hopefully you will pay heed. Then after this, that famous ayah, the central ayah of the, of the surah, so flee, run, go, seek refuge in Allah. And a number of verses have the same meaning. The very famous ayah in Surah al dariyat one of probably the most famous ayah in Surah al dariyat Allah khalaqtu inna wa insa illa li'abudun That we have not created the man with the, the jinn and the mankind except to worship me. What is it? The main purpose of creating you was to give you that choice between choosing Allah or choosing other than Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions after this, verse 57 to 58, I do not require any provision from them and I do not require them to nourish me. Truly Allah, He is the provider and the possessor of strength, uh, for sure. A question, from all the prophets you know, that the ones that we have been told about in the Quran, who do we know to be one of the most generous. Generous. 
generous. Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyone else? Ibrahim. Ibrahim. And this is why Ibrahim Alayhi Salam is mentioned straight after these verses. Because here he is, shows his generosity, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not as a consequence, but he also shows his generosity as well. So, since we are talking about provision, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the generosity of Ibrahim alayhi salam and how he provided it for the angels. And in verse 24, has the story reached you of the honored guests of Ibrahim, which are the angels who came to punish the people of Lut? When they entered his dwelling and said, Peace, as salam, and he said, Peace to people we do not know. So he slipped off to the household and brought a fattened calf, a cow. What this shows us is the generosity of Ibrahim al You can imagine that he wouldn't have been an extremely rich person, he wouldn't have too many cows, but as soon as some guests came and he didn't know, even, even know who these guests were, just met them, he provided for them, he gave them from his provisions. But what happened after this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us on how he provides. He tells us about how he provides for his, for Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 29, his, his wife came up with a shriek and stuck her face and said, what, and me a barren old woman? So these are the verses which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about how his wife was given, or he was given the good news and his wife was given the good news of a child. And she was shocked. Why? Because she had come up at an age where it was very difficult to have children. So the choice that is mentioned in the surah is that is of the one who has the ability to deprive you, to give you, make that choice between Allah or Allah. And then we come to Surah at which is the the, the, the chapter of the mount. And this stresses again the choice between Jannah and Naar. And the central verse in the surah is Kullu ri'im bima kasabarahim. Every man is in pledge of what he earns in verse 21. On one hand, the deniers will face their destiny. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse, uh, in verse 11. To 16. Woe to those who deny, who play at, who play uh, games. The day they are uh, shoved roughly into the fire of hell, this is the fire which, which you denied. So is this magic, or is this what you, or is it that you do not see? Roast in it and bear it patiently, or do not bear it patiently. It makes no difference either way, you are simply being repaid for what you did. And whilst we have been told about the destiny of those who deny, we have been told the destiny of those who believe and are pious. The people, in verse 17 to 19, the people who have taqwa will be in gardens of delight, savoring what their Lord had given them. Their Lord will safeguard them from the punishment of the blazing fire and eat and drink with relish for what you did. But this shows us, the verses that come after this show us that the believers are indeed the winners. They are the ones who will win. In verse 26 to 28, they will say, Beforehand we used to live in fear amongst our families, but Allah has, was gracious to us and safeguarded us from the punishment of the searing wind. Beforehand, we certainly used to call on him because he is the all good, the most merciful. So just as Surah Tur, it ends with the stars fading out, we come to the next Surah, which talk about the stars. And this is Surah Al-Najm. Surah Al-Najm revolves around the choice of taking your knowledge from dubious sources 
or taking it from the best of sources. So you have the revelation of Allah, which there is 100% certainty, or you have the other type of knowledge which is based on illusions and doubts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this verse, these, the, these verses, by talking about the revelation that He sent to His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا يَنْسِفُ عَنِ الْهَوَى إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْنُ يُوحَى عَلَّمَهُ شَهِيدُ الْقُوَى Then He does not speak of His wings and He does not speak of His desires. Rather, it is revelation that has come down upon Him and it was taught to Him by one who is immensely strong, meaning Jibra'il The one who is dependable, the one who is carrying the revelation from Allah Jalla wa'ala to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala presents uh, an aspect of the Isra wa Mi'raj <coughs> where knowledge and vision are of an example of knowledge and vision which are true. That only one who is speaking from the revelation of Allah could be, uh, could, could, be uh, could come up with this. In verse 6 to 14. Possessing power and splendor, he stood there stationary, there on the highest horizon. horizon. Then he drew near and hung suspended. He, saw, he was too uh, bow lengths away or even closer. Then he revealed to his slave what he revealed. His heart did not lie about what he saw. What? Do you, disp do you dispute him about what he saw? He saw him again another time by the low tree of the final minute. So this ayah is addressing the disbelievers, saying that how do you accuse the Messenger of Allah? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam of lying, of coming with untruths when already he has seen the greatest sign, uh, greatest of his Lord's signs. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the verse 17 to 18, His eye did not waver, nor did he look away. He saw some of the greatest signs of his Lord. So as this surah is talk, presenting to us two paths, the path of certain knowledge, which is from Allah, and the path of <coughs> doubts, we are told about the, the paths of those of the disbelievers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 23, illa dhanna wa ma tahwal anfus wa laqad huda that they are following nothing but conjecture, but doubts, and what their own selves desire, and that, and that when guidance has reached them from their Lord. So they have rejected the guidance of the Lord, they have rejected the sound, 100% authentic knowledge. And the surah continues, talking about the suspicions. In verse 27, those who do not have Iman in the next world will give the angels uh, female names. So they're making things up, saying that the angel females they have, that they're giving them names and so on and so forth. In verse 28, they have no knowledge of this. They are only following conjecture. Conjecture is no avail, whatever, uh, uh, no avail to whatever is against the truth. He also says in verse 30, that is as far as their knowledge extends. Your Lord knows best those who are misguided from his way, and he, and he knows best those who are guided. So this surah is talking about authenticating knowledge. Authenticate your knowledge. And surah uh, Najm it ends with, with a prostration. And this goes in harmony with the next surah, Surah Al-Qamr. Surah Al-Qamr begins with, uh, the hour has drawn near and the moon has split. So how you know that the hour is coming, so what do you do? What do you do when the hour is coming? You prostrate to him. We notice also that Surah Al-Alaq and Surah Al-Najm, they both end with, they both have very similar meanings or contents, and that is the concept of knowledge. And sometimes when someone becomes, uh, has, possesses knowledge, they can become very arrogant with their knowledge. So what is the solution to this? The best thing that they can do is to show humility, to humble themselves. And what is the best way of humbling oneself? Is to prostrate. 
And that's how each of the sutras end with prostration. The cure to arrogance. Surah Al-Qamar and Surah Al-Rahman, they are two surahs which represent two sides of the same coin. There are two ways of knowing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The first way is through his indignations and the second way is through his blessings. Surah Al-Qamar focuses on the first through his indignations, while Surah Al-Rahman focuses on the second which is through blessings. We notice that in Surah Al-Qamar, the Surah of the Moon, it observes Allah's retaliation. <coughs> Allah's retaliation upon the past disbelieving nations. So here we have been told to decide which path. Do we follow this path or do we follow the path of other than that? So let's take the example of the people of Nuh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in verse 9, before them, the people of Nuh denied the truth. They denied our slave, saying he is a madman and he was driven away with tears. Allah also tells us in verse 10, He called upon his Lord, I am overwhelmed, so help me. What was the result? What was the result upon of Nuh alayhi salam dua, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 11 and 12. So we opened the gates of heaven with torrential water and made the earth burst forth with gushing springs and the waters met together in a way which was decreed. We learn also of another scene where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the people of Ad in verse 18 and 19. Ad denied the truth, how terrible were my punishments and word warnings. We unleash the howling wind against them on a day of unremitting horrors. And we are told also about the people of the Lord and the people of Lut. There is punishment after punishment after punishment, and even on the people of Fir'aun. The people of Fir'aun are mentioned in verse 41 and 42. Warning came to, to Pharaoh's people. They did, dismissed every one of our signs, and so we seized them with a seizing of one who is almighty and all powerful. So here we show, we find that this is a surah of the retaliation, the revenge, the vengeance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon the disbelieving nations. And we notice one factor, a, fact, some, a number of factors that are in common between each of these nations. First of all, that any people who deny Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after they have been shown his signs, then they will face in full force the torment, the punishment of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the surah begins and concentrates with a sign that the disbelievers had witnessed the splitting of the moon, the miracle of the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The hour has drawn near and the moon has split. And this is a message to them, to the Quraysh that you have seen this great sign. So you have noticed, you have been told about the signs about the previous nations and how they were destroyed. Be careful or you yourself will be a sign like this. But it is only, and Allah SWT says in verse 2, if they see a sign, they turn away saying, there is no end to this witchcraft. This is just magic. It is only due to the dua of the Prophet Wasallam that he saved his ummah from being punished in such a manner. <coughs> and the Surah then also talks, as we mentioned, about the former nations, indicating that the Makkans, they, the Makkan disbelievers, the Quraysh, they are no better than their ancestors. A kuffarukum khayrun min ulaikum am lakum baraatun fi zulur. That are your kuffar better than those people? Or have you been given exemption in the books? <laughs> and the battle of Badr is also foretold in them as a type of retaliation, a great victory, humiliation upon the people of Quraysh. In verse 45, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, the translation, the assembly will, will be rooted and will turn their backs in flight. They are also told about other calamities that will follow. 
In verse 46, in fact, the hour is their promised appointment and the hour is more disastrous and bitter. <coughs> but in all of this, narrating the destruction of those who deny the previous nations, the surah, surah demonstrates that the Quran is a sole means to avoid this humiliation, this torment, this destruction. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made the Quran easy. Now, have we not made the Quran easy to remember, but is there anyone to remember? And sometimes people, when they're going through difficulties, they become closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and this is a form of blessing for them. But for others, it is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala subhanahu wa ta'ala bestows them with blessings that they are able to know him and to become closer to him. And this is the message of Surah al rahman that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala discusses in blessings. But one of the blessings or one of the people or one of those who are being addressed here, which is very uh, which is not very common in, in many of the surahs, but whenever the surahs are, 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 are uh, addressing the people, who they are addressing are the mankind. <coughs> but this surah, it is addressing both mankind and jinn. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سَنَفْرُوهُ لَكُمْ أَيُّهُ And so we will set in your affairs the two of your classes, meaning the jinn and the mankind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says in verse 33, the company of jinn and men, if you are able to pierce through the confines of the heavens and the earth, pierce through them. You will not be able to pierce through them except with clear authority. So notice that the ones who will be addressed here are the jinn and the mankind. <clears throat> and the most frequent, frequent uh, ayah in this surah is So which of your Lord's blessings will you deny? And the way in which it is mentioned is mentioned in the dual form. So the ones who are being addressed is from which of your Lord's blessings, and the word your Lord is which of your Lord, meaning the mankind's Lord and the jinn's Lord, do you deny? So they're both being addressed. So the surah lists a number of blessings that, and a number of them which uh, discuss uh, the uh, discuss things which we may perhaps not even realize. Just before we even go further with this, what are the two other stories which heavily discuss the concept of blessings? And what are the difference between those two surahs? Can anyone remember? Two surahs which talk about the blessings of Allah. No? Surah Al Nahal is one of them. What's the other one? Surah Ibrahim. What's the difference between Surah Nahal and Surah Ibrahim? Surah Ibrahim? Can you remember? No? Surah, Surah Nahal talks about all types of blessings. Surah Ibrahim talks about the greatest blessing, and that is of Iman. Okay? So try to always connect each of the aims and the themes of the surahs and connect them with other surahs as well. So this is also talking about blessings. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us about blessings that we didn't even think too much about. In verse 7 to 9, <coughs> He created the heavens and established the balance so that you, you will not transgress the balance. Give just weight, do not skim the balance of justice. He also said in 19 and 20, he has let loose the two seas, converging together with a barrier between them, that they do not break through. Again, we have been told about choosing between two paths. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about those who deny Allah's blessings, and he mentioned this in verse 39 to 44. That day, no man or jinn will be asked about, about his sin. So which of your Lord's blessings do you deny? The, evils, the evil doers will be recognized by their mark, and seized by their forelock and their feet, so which of your blessings do you deny? This is hell which is the evil this is the hell which the evils evil doers deny. They will go back and forth between the fire and scalding water. So these are the first type or first choice that have been that has been presented to us, the choice of those who deny and the description of the hellfire as being mentioned there. 
The second are those who are the people of paradise, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us. For those who, in verse 46 and 47, for those who fear the station of their Lord, there are two gardens. So which of your blessings do you deny? So sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the hellfire and then he mentions the paradise. And sometimes he just mentions the hellfire on its own. And this is more powerful because the main address of the Quran is to the believers. And in reality, of course, the disbelievers are invited to read it. But the ones who will uh, respond to the Quran more is the, the believers. That there is no doubt in this book. It is a guidance for the muqtaqeen. Does it mean it's not a guidance for the disbelievers? Of course it is. For the ones who are more receptive to this, to this guidance of the believers. So in order for us to appreciate Jannah more, we have to learn also about the horrors of the hellfire in order to understand the great blessing of Jannah. <coughs> so here are those two surahs. Surah Qamar, we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his punishment, and then we also know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Rahman through his blessings. Then we come to Surah Al-Waqi'ah. Surah Al-Waqi'ah, we are told about three different categories. The Ashab, the Asabiqun, who are the forerunners who are considered to be the closest and the nearest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ashab al yameen people of the right, and Ashab al uh, shimal who are the people of the left. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 7 to 10, now you will be classed into three, the companions of the right. So what are the companions of the right? And the companions of the left, who are the companions of the left? And the forerunners, and this is mentioned in verse 7 to 10. Each of those, the fate of these, each of those categories is concluded at the end of the surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions it 88 to 94. But the truth is that one of those brought near, there is solace and sweetness and a garden of delight. And if he is one of the companions of the right, peace be upon you from the companions of the right. And if he is one of the misguided deniers, there is hosp uh, hospitality of scolding water and roasting uh, of the blazing of the fire. So after the surah mentions the fate awaiting each of these categories, we are, it urges us to contemplate on the creation and to check our inclination as to making that right choice. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in 58 to 59, Have you thought about the drop that you were made from? Is it that you created it or is it we who are the creators? <coughs> Subsequently, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the miracle of sowing and growing, the miraculous process of sowing and growing. Have you thought about what you cultivate? Is it you who make it, or is it we who make it? He says in 68 to 69, have you thought about the water that you drink, or is it that, or is it that you sent it down from the clouds, or we are the sender? He talks also about the fire, that have you thought about the fire that you light? Is it that you make the trees that fuel it, Fuel it or grow, or is it we who are the one who makes it grow? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions so many of the blessings, and after this, and he says, and glorify your Lord the most magnificent. So before the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he asks us to make this choice. Before we die, he says in verse 83 to 85, Why then, when death reaches his throat and you are at the moment looking on, and we are nearer to him that, but that, that you, but you cannot see. We notice that there is a reminder of praise between these the surahs that we covered. In Surah Al-Waqi'ah it includes the sabbih bismi rabbika al-azim. So celebrate the praises of your Lord the Supreme. And this comes in conformity with Surah Tawr, which, which ends with wa min al-layli fa sabbihu wa idhabaa sujood wa idhabaa sujood which is, and for part of the night, also praise him, and at the retreat of the stars. 
And we notice that Surah Al-Najm also is, ends with prostration. So, what we notice here, or a current theme between the endings of many of the stories that we've covered so far about the concept of choice, is that what helps us to make that choice is through praising and worshipping Allah Jalla Wa'ala. So just as Surah Al-Waqi'ah ends فَسَبِّحْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الْعَظِيمِ We learn that the next Surah, Surah Al-Hadid, which also talks about two choices, begins with the concept of, 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 of making this tasbih. Sabbah lillahi ma tisma'atu So what is the choice that is mentioned in Surah Al-Hadid? The choice between in Surah Al-Hadid is uh, with a discussion related to materialism and spirituality. So it's a choice between materialism, materialism and spirituality. Not that we choose between them, but we make a balance between them. The central ayah is the ayah in, 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 in verse 25. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, That we send down iron in which the material for mighty war as well as many benefits of mankind. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that iron is used for two things. Hadiths, which the surah is named after, is mentioned for two things. The first thing is that of warfare, for tanks, for guns, and so on and so forth. Or it can be used to benefit people. So everything we see around us, there's something there which is made out of iron. So what is the aim of the surah? The aim of the surah, as I said, is the balance between materialism and spirituality. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore talks about two types of people, two categories. The first category are those who dedicate themselves to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and do, do nothing else. Then we come across the second type of people who are immersed in worldly affairs and they do not worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that much. So we have been told to choose between them. Except not between them exclusively, but to find a middle path, path between them. That we have between, uh, between them a spiritual and a material path. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in addressing those who had not concentrated enough on their spiritual uh, cultivation. He says, "Alam yaqul al-ladina amanu an taqsha qulubuhum bi dhikr Allah wa ma nazal min al-haq, wa la yaqul al-ladina qutul kitab min qabl min qabl wa tafala alayhi al-amr wa qasat qulubuhum wa kathiru minhum fasiqun." There has not the, has not the time arrived for the hearts of those who have iman to yield to the remembrance of Allah. And to the truth he has sent down, so they are not like those who were given the book before them, whom when the time seemed to be very long, that their hearts had become hard. Many of them are deviators. That's worth uh, paying attention to. But cathedral will not pass it on. We're going to come across this in a moment. So this was revealed to the companions and the uh, and uh, some of the companions in the Rasul of the Allah and also mentioned this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent this, this ayah down to admonish us because our hearts had become hardened. Because a revelation was coming, revelation was coming, and we our hearts had become hardened, and so we needed to concentrate on our spiritual welfare. Another ayah that follows this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that know that Allah brings earth to life after it was dead. So here he is using a very uh, visual symbolism of the hardness of the heart, of the hardness of the heart and how rain is able to bring life back to the dead earth just like revelation is able to bring uh, 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 bring salvation to the heart. And this concept of revelation being used as a symbol, uh, sorry, brain is being used as a symbolism for revelation occurs many times in the Quran. Then we have the other category, the category of those who concentrate on spirituality in excess. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 27, 
Then we set our messengers following in their footsteps and sent Isa, the son of Maryam, after them, giving them the gospel, we put compassion and mercy in the hearts of those who followed him. This is good, but the second part of the ayah talks about the, ex the excessive nature. They invented monasticism, meaning that they would spend time in the monasteries. We did not prescribe it for them purely out of desire to gain the pleasure of Allah, but even so, they did not observe it as it should have been observed. To those of them who had Iman, we gave them reward, but many of them are deviators. How did this verse end? The very way that the last end, uh, verse ended regarding spirituality. So we have two groups that are being mentioned. Those who are excessive, not paying enough attention to the spiritual, taking care of their hearts, and then you have the others who are excessive in taking care of their spiritual hearts, compromising this with other matters which are important, such as the worldly affairs. Both of those categories of people, those of both of those ayahs, they end with the cathedral minhum classic for the many of them are deviators who are transgressive. So the message here, the surah delivers the following message to the end of the Prophet. Find the path between them. Find the path between them. Don't be excessively uh, spiritual, where example that some of the Christians they would not even marry, the monks they would dedicate their life in the monasteries, and so on and so forth. And don't go to the other extreme where you become very uh, uh, you you're taken uh, uh, taken back by the uh, worldly affairs. And for this reason, a significant ayah in the surah is verse twenty five, where Allah subhanahu wa taala says. We sent our messengers with clear signs and sent down the book and the balance with them so that mankind might establish justice. And we sent down iron in which the material for mighty war as well as many benefits for mankind. So it stresses upon the materialistic side, then it moves on to by, by saying, so that Allah might know those who help him and his messengers in the unseen, Allah is strong and almighty. So in this verse, in verse 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the material aspect and then after that, in the very same verse, he discusses the concept of unseen, emphasizing on the spiritual, which, which is basically telling us to strike a balance between the two. <clears throat> but this rule is not just there for our own, it's been present there for the previous ones as well. This rule is not subject to change throughout time. The balance is required. Allah subhanahu wa tells us in verse 26, We sent Nuh and Ibrahim and placed prophethood in the book among their descendants. Some of them are guided. <coughs> of the things which are mentioned in the surah, the word Nuh appears three times. And it emphasizes or shows us the essence of balance in Islam. So here we have Nur being mentioned in the context of earth. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 28, you who have Iman have taqwa of Allah and Iman in, in his messenger. He will give you a double portion of his mercy and grant you a light, Nur, by which to walk and forgive you. Allah is most forgiving and most merciful. And then he also has a Nur that is mentioned for the heavens. If we have something for the dunya, we also have a nur for the akhirah. Those who have the iman in Allah and His Messenger, such people are truly sincere, and the martyrs who are with their Lord will receive their wages and their lives. But what is the transition between them? The transition between this life and the hereafter is the sirat. And Allah also mentions this in verse 12. On the day you see men and women of the Mu'bi Moon with their light, Streaming out in front of them, and, their, and to their right, good news for you today for the gardens with rivers flowing under them, remaining in the privacy forever. That is a great victory. So, when we contemplate about the superiority of this religion and also contemplate the balance, we will find that that there that your our keenness in finding submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Finding a balance in this life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us the light. 
And by that light, it will help us to get through the Sirat. And by that light, we will also be in Jannah with, with that Lord. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reserves a specific mention for the Nur or a group because they tend to find the balance between the spiritual and its material life. And who are they? They are the martyrs. They are the shuhada. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 19, such people are truly sincere and the martyrs who are with their Lord will receive their wages and their lives. Why? Because if you, can, if you think about it, they are the ones who are material in the sense that they are fighting, they are dealing with iron, material warfare, but at the same time they are spiritual as well. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us their example as those who fit the balance between material and spiritual life. <coughs> and in the, very, <coughs> in the very beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala demonstrates his balance in the universe and how he governs it. So example in verse 3 and 4, he says, He is the first and the last, the outward and the inward. He is the awwal wal wal akhir wal bahir wal batin. And he has full knowledge of all things. It is he who created the heavens and the earth. He knows what goes into the earth and what comes out, what comes down from the heaven and what is come, uh, and what, uh, uh, and what uh, comes into it. He is with you wherever you are and Allah sees what you do. He also mentioned in verse 6 that he makes night merge into the day and day merge into the night. He knows what the heart contains. So all of these different contrary phenomena that we found in Surah Tarad and other surahs as well, we, we realize the magnificence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how he is able to create a balance in his governance and also in his creatures and world, in, in, in his universe. So these, this surah, this 27th uh, juz, it tells us to choose a path. So we find that the path of choice between the paradise and the hellfire, which we found in surah Qaf and surah Tur, we found that we, there was a choice between being the forerunners, the people of the right or people of the left, and sort of and preferring uh, blessings and misfortunes in Surah sort of Rahman and Surah sort of, uh, Qamar, and then we also found the choice between following the, 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 the correct authentic knowledge and the inauthentic knowledge in Surah sort of Najm, and then we found choosing between giving and depriving in Surah sort of Dariyat, and finally in Surah sort of Hadith. The, the, the excessive materialism and excessive uh, spirituality. So this is sort of uh, this surah, uh, these surahs they, they they revolve around the concept of choosing that path. So we'll stop here, inshallah, and then in the next session we'll go over uh, Juz 28, so from Surah Mujadila to Surah Tahrim. If there's any questions, uh, please go ahead. Otherwise, uh, we'll take a 10-minute break, inshallah. No? Okay, we'll take a 10 minute break, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs>